This is chapter 9. <clears throat> Styles was dying, and he was delirious. They all knew he was dying, and by now the Apaches knew it also. Sometimes he cried out, his voice rising in a thin, wavering wail in the still hot air of the desert. Junie sat beside him, putting damp cloths on his brow and sponging his face at intervals. Grant Kimbrough paced restlessly. His coat was thrown aside and his shirt sleeves rolled up. The gun he wore was visible now, and Logan's, Logan Cates noticed it thoughtfully. It was a gun that had, been, had seen much use. Kimbrough's face was haggard, and he was unshaven. There was an impatience in him that had not been obvious before. The heat, the waiting, the expectation of attack, and the cries of the dying man were affecting them all. Overhead, the buzzard had been joined by another. They swept in wide, loose circles against the heat-glazed sky. Nothing happened. Kimbrough turned suddenly on Cates. We've got to get out of here. He was almost shouting. We can't stay any longer. Kimbrough glared at him, then strode away, his face stiff with fury. <laughs> Excuse me. Hey. Life happens. Let's back up. Kimbrough turned suddenly on Cates. We've got to get out of here. He was almost shouting. We can't stay any longer. Sorry, says Cates. Kimbrough glared at him, then strode away, his back stiff with fury. Jennifer came to him from near the fire. Logan. Her use of his first name startled him. There's not much food left. How much? Enough for today and a little for tomorrow. He would have been thinking of that. Nobody had carried much food and they had been stretching it out as far as possible. That it had lasted this long was surprising, and at least partially due to the fact that there was too much else to worry about and nobody had, nobody had eaten more than a few bites. It was necessary to maintain a constant watch. Their position was secure only so long as they were vigilant for they were in the arroyo, and once an Apache was able to reach the edge of it, all their positions became un untenable. <coughs> so then, they might have to make a run for it after all. How slim their chances would be once they left this trough in the rocks he well knew. Bupri and Lugo knew also, and Sheehan. How much the others knew, he could only guess, but Kimbrough, Taylor, and Zimmerman all wanted to be moving. Yet once in the open, tied down by the few horses they had, they would be sitting ducks for the Apaches. All the Indians needed to do was hang off on their flanks and pick them off as opportunity offered. No, they must stay here. Even as he made the decision, he kept his mind open, hoping for a chance for some other way out. South as had been suggested. But what then? There was no place to go for many, many miles, only an empty, deserted shore, sandy and miserable with intense heat, doubtful water supplies, and only the faint hope of sighting a fishing boat from the south or a steamer headed for the mouth of the Colorado. <coughs> well, Zimmerman asked, what do we do? Stay here and starve or make a run for it? Grant Kimbrough glanced up at him. From his seat by the fire, his face expressionless. Yes, leader, there was a tinge of sarcasm in his voice. We'd like to know, what do we, what do, what do, we do now? We sit tight, said Logan. Damn it, man, Taylor sprang to his feet. Are you crazy? We'll all starve to death or be picked off one at a time, like that poor soldier. I move we hit the desert and hit running. What about the women, Kate's asked mildly. Taylor's eyes shifted, and he looked angry, but he was a stubborn man. I move we run for it, he said. How much chance would we have in the open? Cates asked. Not much, I'd say. And how much water could we carry? I'm ready to go any time, Webb said. 
I don't believe there's more than half a dozen Apaches out there. We stay, Kate said. We sit tight. You stay, Zimmerman was you stay, Zimmerman was ugly. I'm going and I'm going now. And I'll go with him, Webb declared. If you go, Kate said, you'll have to walk. No horses are leaving here. Zimmerman turned slowly. He looked at Cates with a slow, measuring glance. I say I'll ride out of here, he said softly, and I think I'll ride that zebra done. Grant Kimbrough leaned back on his elbow, a faintly amused expression on his face. Sheehan, Beaupre, and Lugo were away on watch or sleeping. Lonnie Forma was up on the rocks. Those who remained were against him, except perhaps the women. Logan Cates stood flat-footed, his feet a little apart. He was going to have to kill Zimmerman. He could see it coming, and he did not want to do it. The big soldier started forward, and Webb moved a little to the left, and Logan Cates stepped back a little, his hand poised over his six-shooter. I'd get back if I were you, he said coolly. I don't want to kill either of you. We need you. We don't need you, Zimmerman said, grinning, and you won't have and you won't draw. That's right, Kimber said quietly. He won't. It was unexpected. Kimbrough's pistol covered Kate's. Grant, Jennifer cried out. No. They're right, Jennifer, Kimbrough said. We've got to ride out of here. It's our only chance. Take his gun, Zimmerman. No. Junie Hatchet had Big Marth Big Maria's shotgun, and she was holding it as if she knew how to use it. The shotgun was aimed at Kimbrough, and the range was no more than thirty feet. You drop that gun, Mr. Kimbrough, and you drop it now. You make yourself a move, and I'll cut your head off. The second barrel goes for him. She jerked her head to indicate Zimmerman. And if you don't, if you don't think I'll do it, you just hold that pistol until I count to two. One, two. Kimbrough backed up, his face swollen. You better not go to sleep, Cates. If you do, I'll kill you. When he's asleep, Junie said, I'll be awake, mister. Hmm. As they moved away, Cates turned to Junie Hatchet. Thanks, he said simply. She glanced at him. If anybody can get us out of here, she said, it'll be you. Jennifer looked after her as the girl returned to the fire. I see what you meant, Jennifer said. There is iron in her. She hesitated. Do you think she would have shot Grant? Cates nodded grimly. She'd have shot him. She would have done just what she said she would do. And what's more, they both knew it. Her finger was taken up slack when he dropped that pistol. I can't understand it, Jennifer said, frowning. What could have come over Grant? Logan Case let his eyes wander along the edges of the arroyo. Maybe he got carried away, Kate suggested dryly. It's times like this that bring a man to face to face with himself. The sun flared like a burnished sword, and the sky was like a white-hot sheet of steel. Around them, the lava grew too hot to touch, and they led the horses to water and returned them again to the thin shade in the lower arroyo. During all this time, the desert stirred with no sound. The Apaches gave no indication of their presence, and no quell called, nor did the wind blow, nor did any stone rattle in the parched silence. The thirty, the thirty... The thirsty sky drank of the pools, and the people at the water holes drank, and the water seemed to fall away beneath them. <laughs> In the late afternoon, a restless Conley, tired of sitting and watching where nothing was, lifted his head a little to peer at a cluster of rocks and brush. The report of the rifle was thin in the great silence and distance, a little lost sound in the emptiness. The young soldier fell, tumbling down among the rocks and lay there still. Jennifer was first to reach him, then Big, Mar Big Maria and Kate's. Maria looked up. Just burned him, she said. He'll be all right. Kate's descended into the lower arroyo. Bupri was resting in the shade. Lugo was crouched immovable against a rock face. Kate squatted beside him. What do you think? How many are out there? Tony Lugo shrugged. I think 20, more maybe. I think Chirupatai won't attack with less. We need food, Kate said. I'll try it tonight. You get killed. No, Kate's indicated a thin spot in the brush near the base of a smoke tree. 
I go down the arroyo, tell nobody but you. I can go like an Indian. With the glasses, I have seen some mountain sheep south of here. They want to come for water, and they wait to see if we will go away. I think I can find them. They'll hear the gun. No, I'm going to use a bow and arrow. I have used them many times when I lived among the Cheyenne. I make you. You let me go. No, I'll go. But you can make it. If I started, they would be wondering why. I don't want anyone to know where I am. You understand? The need for food was serious. A few days might make all the difference, and Logan Cates knew that by now there was doubt in Yuma. The sheriff's posse had not returned, and already they would be talk of there would be talk of sending out another group to find the first, or their bodies. The disappearance of the soldiers at the same time would immediately alert the people at Yuma to the probability of an Indian attack. All travel from the east would have, would have ceased also, and these indications would be sufficient to allow them to understand what had happened. There were not enough men at the fort to send out an expedition, but combined with what civilians could be sent out there would be a good-sized party. There was, a, there was every chance for survival if they could wait the Indians out. Up to now, the fight was all on the side of the defending party. Stiles was dying. He had even ceased to cry out now, but otherwise they were still a formidable fighting force if he could keep them together, and their position was excellent. Despite the falling of the water, there was enough for several days, even if the terrible heat continued. It was far over 100 degrees, but with food they could make it. The mountain sheep, a type of bighorn slightly different from those far to the north, were excellent eating, and it was likely they had never been hunted. He had noticed them on the ridges looking toward the wells several times, and they might still be there. If he could get a sheep there was a good chance they could last out the week. By that time, there might be a relief expedition sent out. It was true that such a force would be likely to go along the route of the, to the north, but when they reached Bates Well and found it dry, then there would be time to start putting two and two together. In Yuma, they knew the Papago Wells, and they would come south and find them. Everything depended on keeping the party intact. He dared not let Zimmerman realize he was absent but the big soldier would be stirring up trouble. Sheehan would try to keep him in line, but tough as the sergeant was, he would be no match for the younger, tougher Zimmerman. It was well after dark when Logan Cates made his move. Kimbrough was on watch in the rocks, and Lonnie asleep. Zimmerman had turned in also, lying near Big Maria, yet far enough off she would not be suspicious. The other men were scattered on watch, were sleeping, and Cates had told no one but Lugo what he intended to do. He left his pistol and took only the bow, half a dozen arrows, and his bowie knife. Lying flat, he eased his way under the lowest limbs of the smoke tree and into the rocks. When there, he lay still for several minutes, listening. Then, with infinite care, he snaked down into the rocks and out on the edge of the sand. Again, he paused to listen. When half an hour had passed, he was no more than 50 yards from the barricade, and he had seen no one. Then, just as he was about to move, there was a subdued rustle of movement. Not 10 feet from him, a dark form moved from the shadow to some brush and started up the wash towards the barricade. Waiting until the Indian had gone, Cates rose soundlessly from the ground and moved out. Another hour passed, and then he saw the first of the bighorns. He heard it before he saw it, heard it cropping grass upwind of him, but against the side of a bluff and invisible. Notching an arrow, he settled back to wait. He was close. The slightest sound might startle the bighorn into a run, and it might be impossible to get to so close to another. So he would not move. He would not move at all. The minutes ticked slowly by, and several times he, would, he heard the movement of the bighorn's feet on rock. Yet he could see nothing. Yet on his left there was a place where the bluff fell away, and when the sheep got that far, he would be skylined. He waited over the bluff. He waited. Over the bluff in the distance there was a lone star hanging in the dark sky. He heard the bighorn step lightly, and then another sound. It was another sheep, further back, or was it? 
He held very still, listening. Somewhere not a dozen feet away, he could hear the faint breathing of another man. He hesitated, and suddenly the sheep moved, and Kate's heard the sharp twang of a bowstring, and heard the thud of the arrow striking home, and the startled grunt of the bighorn. The sheep lunged, then fell to its knees, then rolled over. The horn striking on the rock with a metallic sound, instantly an Indian arose from the rocks and started forward. For a breathtaking instant, the, inst the Indian was himself outlined, and Logan Cates turned his bow, loosed his arrow, and missed. And the instance of turning some sound had warned the Apache, for he turned swiftly and instantly sprang at Cates. Knocked over backwards by the hurtling body, Cates could only throw up his knees to protect his stomach. The Indian struck him with his body, and Cates threw him off with a convulsive jerk, then rolled over, drawing his knife, and he rolled. The Apache struck at him, and Cates fell, the whisper of the razor-sharp blade as it missed his ear and cut sharply into his shirt. At the same time, Cates struck a wicked left-hand blow into the Indian's belly. The Apache was knocked back by the blow, almost winded, and they both came to their feet together. Cates cut quickly with his knife, felt it strike and glance off. And then they were tied in a, in a clinch, and something warm, wet, and slippery was making his hands fight for their grip. The Indian broke free and backed off a step, and Cates followed, crouching, holding his knife low with the cutting edge up, ready to strike for the soft lower part of the Indian's body. They circled warily in the Indian attack. He came in low, the knife gleaming bright in the starlight, and Cates caught the blow with his own heavier blade, the two clashing as they came together. Then, even as the blades clashed, Cates stepped in and jerked the knife up with all his strength. It slid off the Indian's blade and plunged into his body. The Apache gave a hard gasp and said something, too low for Cates to distinguish, then slid to the ground. From the choking, gurgling sound, Cates knew the man was dying. He backed away from him, then looked around to orient himself. He must find the bighorn, cut it up, and get back as swiftly as possible. It was a blaze of white on the animal's belly that guided him to it. Swiftly he skinned the sheep, working fast in the darkness, and working in by touch, gathering the two hindquarters, the saddle, and every available bit of meat he could get in a few minutes. He had to work. In the few minutes he had to work, Cates bundled it all into the hide and straightening up, bow and arrows in hand, and started, he started back. <clears throat> for several moments, for, I'm sorry, for several minutes he hurried, trying not to stumble, fighting to breathe, and then he found the arroyo. There he paused for several minutes, listening. He remembered the Indian who had gone up the arroyo as he came down it. That Indian could possibly could probably still be there, shifting the burden to his left hand, which also gripped the bow and arrows. Cates drew his knife again and started up the wash, expecting that at every step to be attacked. It was very still as he worked his way through the jungle of growth in the bottom of the wash. From time to time he paused to listen, then moved forward again. Once a branch caught in the hide of the sheep and twanged sharply as he pulled it free. Hastily, he took three quick steps and crouched low, waiting and listening. Off to his left, he heard a faint whisper of sound as of buckskin rubbing together or a moccasin in the sand. He moved again, quickly, then paused to listen. He was sure he was almost at the place where he had left the oasis, and he eased his burden of meat to the ground. For a long time, he held his breath, listening. Despite the coolness of the night, he was sweating. He shifted the knife to his left hand and rubbed his right palm on his shirt. On one knee, he rested. An hour earlier, Grant Kimbrough had come down from the rocks and walked to the fire. Beaupre had relieved him, and nobody else was moving around. He glanced at the hunt bundled figures on the ground and tasted the scalding coffee. If any of them got out of this alive, they would be lucky. How had he ever got himself into such a predicament? They should never have stopped, but kept running. Long ago, they would have been in Yuma, and from there a man could buy passage to San Francisco or go by stage over the Butterfield route. San Francisco, the lights of the city seemed something that had never been. 
something beyond belief now. That was the life, not this. And old Jim Fair would come to terms. He had nobody but Jennifer, and he would want her to have the best. The thing to do was to get out now to awaken Jennifer, saddle their horses, and make it and make a run for it. The thought came to him suddenly, and he tried to dismiss it, but it returned to his mind. Well, why not? It was doubtful that more than two or three Apaches would be on the watch. It would be sure by now that none of the party would make a break. But how to get the horses out? He considered that, dismissing as impossible all ways but one, a man would have to go down the draw, make an opening in the wall of brush, and get out of that and get out that way. It could be done. From Yuma they could send help, and in the meantime they would be on their way to San Francisco. Kimbrough looked at the dark brown coffee, swirling it in his cup. He had only seventy dollars in his pocket, and it was not enough, of course. And it was not enough. Of course, if he could get in a game in Yuma, and they could sell their horses. He glanced at the place where Jennifer slept. Would she go? She'd be a fool not to. And the chance they should, they and the chance they took would be slight. Still, if there was one more man, he thought of Zimmerman. Then dismissed it. He did not like the big, overbearing soldier. He was a dangerous man. Webb was another story, or Conley, but Conley leaned towards Cates and might not go. Cates. Where was Logan Cates? Kimbrough came suddenly to his feet. Cates was gone. He had not seen the man for hours. Hastily, Kimbrough went from bundle to bundle, checking all there was but those on guard in Cates. I'm just going to do that again. He had, he had not seen the man for hours. Hastily, Kimbrough went from bundle to bundle, checking all there but those on the guard in Cates. He had given them the slip. He was gone. Instantly, Kimbrough felt a sharp anger. Cates had gone and left them behind. What kind of man was that? Hearing a crunch of a boot on the sand, Kimbrough turned sharply. It was Sergeant Sheehan. Cates is gone, Sergeant, Kimbrough said. He pulled out and left us. Sheehan's head came up sharply. I don't believe it. Nevertheless, he's gone. Look and see for yourself. Nonsense, man. He wouldn't. Kimbrough laughed without humor. Nonetheless, he's gone. And if we're smart, we'll all go. We can make it. I think we can make Yuma, all right. And I don't believe there are so many Indians out there. If we put a bold face on it, run for it. Sergeant Sheehan measured Kimbrough coolly. Mister, you're forgetting something. We have 14 people here and just eight horses. Grant Kimbrough started to speak, then stopped. Slowly, the excitement went out of him. Fourteen people and eight horses. But one of those horses is mine, he said. Sheehan nodded shortly. That it is, he said, and turning abruptly, he walked away. That is chapter nine. Libby, God bless.